Um, I'm going to talk to you all today about a fish that doesn't really get talked about too much. And hopefully by the end, maybe we'll think that maybe we should talk about it a little bit more. Um, and so that fish are these guys, trout perch. And I know what you're all thinking, why are they called trout perch? And it's a really, really complicated uh, scientific reason. And it's because they kind of look like a trout, kind of look like a perch. Not it's really a bad um, but they are a small, a prey size, as I would classify them, fish um, that are pretty abundant, about as abundant as you would expect any other um, prey fish in lake systems. So here's some trawl data um, from a forestry survey that I'll get into in a bit. Um, and you can see in these red dots here that I've, I've highlighted um, where trout perch are in, related, in relation to things like smelt and alewife. And they are pretty much at the same density as anything else that would be a prey species, or sometimes even more, um, there's even more of them down there. Um, and then when we think about them, you know, in terms of their energy density, how good they are to eat, they are pretty similar. And here I've just pulled out a few numbers from the literature um, of their caloric, of caloric densities of, of a bunch of different prey fish. And they're about similar to, again, things that predators like to eat, stuff like um, smelts and alewife, um, about the same as something like yellow perch. So they're there, there's a lot of them, and they're pretty good to eat, um, at least in terms of energy. But in Lake Champlain and other systems, and these numbers are a little out of date, this is just data that I had, have access to, we really never see them in predator guts. They never show up. They're never really eaten by things that we would expect to eat them, things like lake trout and bourbon. Bourbon was especially surprising to me if there's anything that's going to eat a, a fish that looks like a trout perch. I would think it would be a bourbon, but we never see them. And so that kind of leaves this kind of, they're kind of this afterthought in food webs, right? They don't really show up in the things that we expect them to see in terms of diet. Um, so they are kind of left out to dry. No one really thinks about them that much. But like I said, they're there, there's a lot of them, and they're good to eat. So um, what are they doing down there, right? Uh, I wanted to find out. Um, so, I'm at UVM, we do work in Lake Champlain. A few other uh, talks kind of um, introduce Lake Champlain, but what I really want to hit is that even though it's one lake, it's divided into five ecologically distinct basins, of which I'm going to talk about two of them. The main lake here, which is a lot deeper, um, a lot less productive, um, and has large mysis populations, which we'll show up later. Um, compared to the Inland Sea, which is not as deep, less cold water, deep habitat, um, a little bit higher in productivity, and doesn't really have mysis um, the same way that the, the main lake does. So no one's really studied this fish, no one's really looked at it. So we're going to start with some kind of basic, you know, way above um, looking at trout perch populations from Lake Sam Champlain. What are the demographics look like, right? How do their size and how do their population sizes differ between these two different uh, ecologically distinct basins? We'll hit that first, and then we'll start to look at what they're eating, right? And how do those communities that they're preying upon vary across these two lake regions? And then at the end, we'll start to touch on what their food web role might actually be, and that's that's the interesting one. They're all it's all interesting, but that's yeah, that's what I'm. So, as I mentioned before, um, we have a forage fish survey at UVM where we do these bottom trawls, building on some work that the state started previously. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of those, uh, so I took data from some of those trawls from the main lake, from these kind of uh, regions that you see in these stars here, um, across up and down the main lake, um, compared to the Inland Sea. And so we uh, took those trawls, we were able to calculate an approximate area swept to get a quantitative estimate of density and biomass per meter squared in the lake. And so starting at that pretty basic level, um, we see that um, in the main lake and inland sea, um, the density in terms of individuals per meter squared is pretty close. We get more um, individuals per meter, slightly more individuals per meter squared in the inland sea. But those fish in the inland sea are way bigger than those in the main lake. Um, the average is, it, there's some fish that are almost double the size in the inland sea that you find in the main lake. So um, again, some pretty interesting distinct systems here that are producing these fish of different sizes with, with bigger, um, yeah, bigger sizes, more um, grams per meter squared here. So that was pretty cool to see, and that tracks with what we understand about the productivity of the system. 
this tendency is more productive, maybe like it's less productive, so we get bigger fish. Um, but yeah, some distinct stuff going on between these two bases. So from there, we wanted to see what these guys were eating. Um, and so we took a subset of those fish that we trawled up in this trawl, um, and we opened them up and looked at the depth contents, um, identified what we could, estimated the biomass, and corrected it for the size of the fish, right? So we're, we're controlling for a bigger fish eating more, um, and we looked at almost over 400 fish across um, these two basins here. And so what are they eating? Well, um, they're eating a lot of different things, primarily a lot of benthic invertebrate, insect larvae, chironomids, things like that, and oligochaetes. Um, amphipods show up, and those three things kind of track with the, only the, the few studies that have um, looked at trout perch diet in other lake systems. Um, but we also see them eating tons of these ostracods, and then pretty interestingly, mysis, which by my kind of um, brief uh, like search through the literature, doesn't really show up in a lot of other lakes. So there's definitely something interesting going on there, um, whether that's like a, I don't know, a Lake Champlain specific thing, but it's a lot of, in a lot of other lakes, they're eating a lot of invertebrates, amphipods, but in the main, or in the main lake at least, they seem to be eating tons and tons of mysis. Um, and then these ostracods show up too. So a lot of benthic invertebrates um, in their diets. If we look at kind of the, the percentage of those things that show up in their diets, again, like I said, in the main lake, a huge portion of their diet, almost a quarter of their diet, is made up of mysis. Um, that doesn't show up in the inland sea because there's, there's not, uh, there aren't mysis populations really in the inland sea, um, only a little bit. Um, what, was pretty, what was pretty interesting to me is that that proportion of their diet, that quarter of their diet, doesn't directly one for one transfer anywhere else um, in the inland sea, right? So they lose a quarter of their diet, they, they lose that mysis proportion in the inland sea, but it kind of gets evenly spread among all these other categories. And then we also see more of these kind of other things show up, isopods, um, leeches, things like that show up in their diet in the inland sea. So again, we see these two, we know that these two distinct systems are different and trout perch are doing seemingly different things in those two systems. Um, also interestingly, uh, interestingly is that um, there, there's a, uh, much higher amphipod populations in the Inland Sea, and those, while they do eat more amphipods in the Inland Sea, those don't um, show up uh, as much as you'd expect based on the, the densities in there. So they're really focused on these benthic invertebrate categories, and this is what I'm going to kind of focus on for the rest of the talk, is these, we get almost a little bit more than 50% of the diet in benthic invertebrate larvae, chironomids, and things like the leaves, things that are in the 70s. So we have their diets, and we wanted to compare how their diets uh, compare to um, the distribution of the, of, the, of the prey communities that are in these different lakes. So we followed up the trawls with some benthic invertebrate community sampling, um, where we dropped these uh, ponars, at our different sites that we sampled uh, uh, trout perch from um, to get a quantitative estimate of the invertebrate densities at each of these depths. So we have a few above the thermocline and we drop a few below the thermocline to see how those communities differ um, across the lake. And so we identified what we saw. We got a length which we can convert to a mass for each of these different uh, invertebrate communities. Um, yeah, and just saw how those uh, compared across the lake. And so again, focusing on 50% of that diet, 50% plus of the trout perch diet, these oligochaetes and chironomids. Um, and then here, so here we have biomass of each of our invertebrate categories. We have depth below the surface, which is by the negative. So zero would be up here at the surface, and we're going down that way. Um, we see similar patterns of chironomid densities with depth, depth between our two basins. There's a lot of chironomids shallow, and then as you get deeper, those communities kind of drop off. And that kind of tracks with uh, some previous invertebrate surveys that had been done in the lake. Um, we're kind of missing them at these two depths here, but the overall pattern is the same, where a lot of chironomids shallow, not a lot of chironomids deep. But when we look at the oligochaetes, 
there's um, a way different pattern in the uh, main lake versus the inland sea. And in fact, this box here is way extend, can extend way beyond um, the scale that I, I previously printed up here. So there can be up to an order of magnitude more elite piece per meter squared in the inland sea than we see in the main lake. That's kind of interesting when we think back to the diets, though, because it's not like they are really relying on those oligochetes, even though they're super dense in the inland sea. They kind of maintain that similar proportion. Um, but yet, yeah, way more oligochetes available in the inland sea to these trout perch than in the main lake. So summing up that portion of this, um, what are the de demographics? Well, we, again, we see larger uh, populations in the uh, inland sea. Um, in size and number than the main lake. Um, they're eating mostly a lot of those benthic invertebrates, so in, insect larvae, uh, oligochetes, things like that. In the main lake, interestingly, we see a lot of their diet going towards mysis, which makes sense. There's lots of mysis available there, but it's kind of somewhat unique for Lake Champlain based on what we've seen. Um, and how do those communities of prey differ across the lake? Um, well, we see similar pyramid densities. Um, with depth across our two uh, lake basins, but really, really high lake heat densities in the inland sea. And that's great, and that's interesting to me, and hopefully you, but certainly to the few UVM people in this room. But what I'm really focused on is what is their role in the food web, right? Again, going back to this thing of thinking about that they eat benthic invertebrates is great, but why don't we see them in predators down there? Why, if they're there, and they're good to eat, why don't things eat them? Why don't things use this energy that's available? So this is a question that has vexed a lot of people. Um, and with some people going as far as calling them a trophic bottleneck, where things get shunted off and they don't get incorporated into the food web at all. Um, and I'm here to tell you that in any energy theory of food webs, that can't happen. You can't have a huge population of a native, pred of a native species that has existed in these food webs for a long time, um, that just isn't used. That's just not how food webs are built and how, how they're created. They don't, they uh, organize themselves to move energy most efficiently. So something should use this big pool of energy. And so to kind of figure this out, I went back to the literature and looked at these older fish books. And they talk about them as predators for some surprising, or as prey for some surprising predators like freshwater drum, brook trout, Here's a pike that ate 63 in a single stomach. They're also mentioned them as a, uh, a host of a walleye-specific tapeworm. Um, and really interestingly, they talk about their ability to move inshore and connect um, shallow and deep food webs by moving back and forth. And this is really cool because um, if we think about lakes and their uh, and the, their how stratification. Uh, how stratification creates these zones for these different food webs by fish that stick to certain temperatures when, when the lake is stratified like this. If we have something moving back and forth between these zones, eating there and moving energy to predators um, from somewhere else, we can, they can really control what uh, we see in those systems. Um, and so I wanted to assess uh, the trout trapper's ability to do that, and I kind of did that um, a quick calculation here. I think I'll only get to one of them. the two things I did. Um, where we converted our biomass of, of fish and inverts to production, a common currency of energy. And so we can tell if we get, if there's more invertebrate production at depth than there is fish down there, we know that they need to be moving somewhere else. Right, so we can convert how much stuff we see to um, productivity, and we can relate that to how many fish there are down there and see, do they, is there enough for them down there, or do they need to go somewhere else? So when we put that all together, it looks like this, where we have our invertebrate, our pyramid production at depth here. We can, we know how much they're being eaten, and we have a trophic transfer efficiency here. And when we calculate that all out, we get a nice negative number here, meaning that there are not enough pyramids at depth to support uh, trout perch populations, at least in the main lake. In the inland sea, we do get a slight surplus, but remember, this would mean that they're eating over 99% of the productive, of the pyramid productivity of a single year. There's other stuff eating pyramids. So even here, again, not evidence that they're doing this, but um, pretty close. 
Really quickly, we can also take a look at the energy, right? So doing a similar conversion where we convert grams per meter squared to energy available for our, uh, our prey communities. Um, and so when we do that, we have our invertebrate densities. We can pull energy numbers from the literature, right? And we can see, of course, way higher productivity of oligarchies in the inland sea, higher uh, uh, energy per meter squared. That makes sense based on what we saw. Um, and we can weight that by the uh, percents that, eat, that our trout perch are using each of those categories. Um, and of course, the trout perch in the inland sea are using more energy per meter squared than those in the main lake. And what's really interesting is that if we divide those two numbers, we get a slightly higher capitalization rate per meter squared of trout perch in the inland sea um, compared to the main lake. So trout perch in the inland sea are using this benthic pathway more efficiently than those in the main lake. So if we think about them moving energy back and forth, more energy is being moved by these trout perch to shallow water habitats um, than in the inland sea, suggesting some different food web function for these guys in these two basins. So really quick, trout perch have definitely do have the capacity to serve as these connectors of these two disparate food webs, which is pretty cool, and they may be moving this deep lake benthic energy into shallow water habitats to make it available for um, these predators. And if we think about that in terms of potential future invaders to Lake Champlain, benthic predators like brown goby and cloud mussels, trout perch might be really important in understanding uh, the role of, uh, in understanding that energy flow now um, before these things get in there. And then in Lake Champlain, we see specific different patterns of energy flow between these two different basins. Um, and so the benthic contribution to food lift may vary across these two sections. And we also potentially might see different age uh, growth rates or some age of length uh, differences between these two basins. And so yeah, with that, I definitely, I want to specifically thank our three undergrads that are authors on this talk that did most of the work. I just set them up and they did what they did. Chris, Eleanor, and Allie, who's not pictured, um, are awesome. And if you're looking for someone, I'll send them your way. Um, and with that, we'll